Hello. All right. Hi. I hear Barack Obama's in town. But you're all here. Maybe I should run. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, this novel, The Enchantress of Florence, um, I'm just going to tell you a bit about it and read something, and then, then we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, it's a novel that came about in a kind of strange way. That I mean, I've been interested in, in history. I mean, I was a history student at college, and so I was interested in, um, in both aspects of this novel separately. And then the Renaissance and, and Mughal India were both things that I've often thought about, but it never occurred to me that they would be in the same novel because there didn't seem to be any possibility of them being in the same novel. Um, and then somehow that impossibility began to seem interesting to me. Uh, here you have two cultures, both at a kind of pinnacle, both having literary, artistic, musical, architectural renaissances you know, of a very high order, which barely knew each other. There's a little bit of travel from Europe to India in this period. Um, the spice trade has begun in South India. The Portuguese had established their little colony in Goa. And, and even in the north, where the Mughal capital of Fatehpur Sikri was, there were the occasional merchants and, and wanderers who showed up. But there's absolutely no evidence in this period of any journey in the opposite direction of anyone from India going to Europe. And the moment I realized that it hadn't happened, I immediately became obsessed with the idea of making it happen. And to invent the thing that is not, you know, is after all the job of the novelist. And, and then it struck me that if it was a woman making the journey, it would be even less likely that it had really happened, and therefore even more interesting to make it up. Um, and so I, I started out trying to think of a story that would allow a woman to journey in the late 15th century between the East and the West, and remember that the world at this time is a very difficult place, I mean, um, then as now, not an easy place to travel around in. You have to imagine, if you leave aside China and Japan because they were so isolated in this period that it sort of doesn't count, um, in the East you had India and the Mughal Empire. Next to that there was an, a sort of rather lawless area, then called Khorasan, which we would now call Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and then as now was entirely populated by very unpleasant savage warlords busily killing each other. Um, next to that, you had the beginnings of the Safavid Persian Empire, the beginnings of Shia Persia. And next to that, you had the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, only just established that Constantinople fell in 1453. Um, and became Istanbul, and that was the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. And west of that, you have Europe. And then you have this large expanse of water called the Ocean Sea. And to the west of that, just bubbling up on the western horizon, there was this strange thing called the New World, um, which people didn't really understand, whose shape people didn't understand, and whose nature people didn't understand, but there it was, just heaving into view. So that's, that's the world of what I guess people call the pre-modern age. And you can imagine that it's not particularly a salubrious world for a woman to travel around in. And the way the story began, or I actually abandoned a couple of plots before I found one uh, that I thought I could make work. And the, the final, the clue, there were two clues. One was in the East and one in the West, fittingly. And the Eastern clue was that in the, in the story of the first of the six great Mughal emperors in the life of the Emperor Babar, there's a moment early in his career before he ever established a kingdom in India when he was just one of those Khorasani warlords, not doing very well, in fact. And there's a moment when he was besieged in the city of Samarkand on the Silk, Ro Silk Route uh, by a rival warlord called Shaibani Khan, who who's told him that if he wanted to get out alive, that the price of his safe conduct would be that he had to surrender his beautiful sister. 
Um, and he did. And he was a little embarrassed about it. Um, and, and in fact, in his autobiography, um, he slightly glosses over it. You know, he says, he says uh, as we left Samarkand, my sister was unfortunately lost. <laughs> um, he, he doesn't say I handed her over to save my own neck, you know, which I guess. Anyway, so she was captured and she remained with this other warlord for 10 years and actually had children with him. And then she was, he was in turn defeated by the Shah of Persia. Uh, the Shah of Persia wanted good relations with the Indian Mughal Empire, so he sent her home. So what happened in real life was that she went home and lived happily ever after. But it occurred to me that she didn't have to go home, <laughs> um, especially if she was of independent mind and found the Shah of Persia attractive. <laughs> she might decide to make a different choice. And so that gave me one clue. And then meanwhile, reading the European stuff that I was trying to find out about for the book. I read after many years um, Ariosto's poem, Orlando Furioso, um, a poem, long narrative poem, but which is not set in, in, I mean, it's written in exactly this period in the 16th century, but it's set much earlier. It's set hundreds of years earlier in the time of Charlemagne, and it's, it's full of witches and ogres and knights in shining armor and the whole apparatus of romance literature. Um, but its major plot theme is an Indian princess arriving in Europe and creating lots of trouble. And everybody's in love with her and they think she's a witch and so on and so on. And so I thought, this is so bizarre. Not only have I not thought of this idea first, but somebody else thought of it 400 years ago. <laughs> um, but it did give me permission, you know, and I, what I felt is that I had these two ends of a journey. Um, and if I could build the bridge in the middle, then I would have the novel. And the bridge is basically that when my fictional princess, after being with the Shah of Persia for some time, when he's defeated by the Ottomans, and I'll read you the bit about that, she falls in love with um, an Italian soldier of fortune who you will meet. And that joins the two worlds, and he's the one who brings her back to Florence. And just before I read, I'm going to read you this bit, which actually takes place neither in India nor in Florence, but at the meeting point, because at this point, the, the Italian mercenary, whose name is Argalia, um, is involved in what became one of the great battles of, the, of, of this period, which, um, the battle between the Turks and the Persians, um, called the Battle of Chaldiran. Um, and in many ways, it's a battle whose effects can still be felt because where, where the border between the two countries fell after that battle is still the border between, between Turkey and Iran. So it really is the moment at which the, the modern world was, in a way, being born there. Um, again, one of the things I should mention is that some of the weirdest stuff in this book is true. And, and essentially, the banal stuff is the stuff I made up. Um, and I should just pre give you, by way of preamble, two clues about how weird real life is. Um, one is that there was a moment when the captor of the princess, the warlord Shaibani Khan, was defeated by the Shah of Persia. The Shah of Persia killed him and cut his body up into pieces and sent the pieces round the empire to prove that he was dead. Um, and then had his skull boiled, and then when it was just bone, set it in golden jewels and turned it into a wine goblet and, and would drink from it at night until he had a better idea. After a while, the better idea was to send it as a present to the Ottoman Sultan in Istanbul and say to him, essentially, this is what I just did to my enemy on my eastern frontier, and since you're the guy on my western frontier, I thought you might like to see it. Um, <laughs> and and uh, to which the Ottoman response was to send a gigantic army against him, and, and the result was this battle. Um, so, again, I didn't make this up at all. So, um, there's also a delicious moment, which unfortunately I'm not going to read to you about, when I discovered that at this exactly the right moment for my purposes, the Ottomans went to war with Dracula. Uh, I mean, actual, you know, Dracula himself, Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Dracula, the dragon. Um, and at the moment when I realized I could have Dracula in my novel, <laughs> Um, you know, without cheating. <laughs> um, I, I just thought, I thought I'd gone to heaven, really. Anyway, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not going to read you the Dracula bit, because it's, it's, 
It's too bloodthirsty. <laughs> the thing about Dracula, you know, is that he was not a vampire. Um, that's something that Bram Stoker made up, but given how blood-soaked he was, a little vampirism would have come as light relief, essentially. You know, it would have been so much better than the kind of mass slaughters for which he was responsible. Um, he also, interestingly, was not the Prince of Transylvania. Um, that's another thing that Bram Stoker made up. Um, Romania has two main provinces, Transylvania to the north and Wallachia to the south, and he was the Prince of Wallachia, which um, is the province which had a common frontier with the Ottomans, and that's hence the conflict. Anyway, no Dracula here. Uh, the only other thing I should point out, there's some tulips in here. Tulips, two things to say about the tulips. One is the tulips, you may not know, originated in Turkey. And they spread elsewhere in the world later. But the, but the Turks, the Ottomans, were absolutely obsessed with tulips and had hundreds of varieties of them. The other thing is that one of the little tulip passages is, I'm sorry to tell you, obscene. But we'll get to that. Um, all right, meanwhile... Uh, so this, I'm going to start off by introducing the character of Argalia, the Italian soldier. Argalia's 45th birthday had come and gone. He was a tall, pale man, and in spite of the years of war, his skin was as white as a woman's. Men and women alike marveled at its softness. He was a lover of tulips and had them embroidered onto his tunics and cloaks, believing them to be bringers of good fortune. And of the 1,500 varieties of Stambul tulip, six in particular were to be found thronging his palace rooms. The light of paradise, the matchless pearl, the increaser of pleasure, the instiller of passion, the diamond's envy, and the rose of the dawn. These were his favorites. And by them, he was revealed as a sensualist beneath his warrior's exterior, a creature of pleasure hiding inside a killer's skin, a female self within the male. He had, to a woman's taste for finery. When not in battle dress, he lounged in jewels and silks and had a great weakness for exotic furs, the black fox and lynx of Muscovy, which came down to Stambul through the Crimea. <coughs> his hair was long and black as evil, and his lips were full and red as blood. Blood at its shedding had been his life's concern. Under Sultan Mehmed II, he had fought a dozen campaigns and won every battle in which he raised his arquebus to the firing position or unsheathed his sword. He had drawn a platoon of loyal janissaries around him like a shield. Oh, people who don't know, the janissaries were like the elite troops of the Ottoman army. They were like the marines of the ancient world, really. Um, many of whom were mercenaries, some of whom were former slaves. Anyway, he had drawn a platoon of loyal janissaries around him like a shield with the Swiss giants, Otho, Botho, Clotho, and D'Artagnan um, as his lieutenants. And though the Ottoman court was full of intrigues, he had foiled seven assassination attempts. After Mehmed's death, the empire came close to civil war between his two sons, Bayezid and Chen. When Argalia learned that the Grand Vizier had refused to bury the dead sultan's body for three days so that Chen could reach Stambul and seize the throne, he led the Swiss giants to the vizier's quarters and killed him. He led Bayezid's army against the would-be usurper and drove him into exile. Once that was done, he became the new sultan's commander-in-chief. After that, the main problems came from the Shiite people of Anatolia. They wore red hats with 12 pleats to show their fondness for 12 Shiism, and as a result, they were very attracted to Shah Ismail of Persia, who styled himself the very god. Bayezid's third son, Salim the Grim, wanted to crush them utterly, but his father was more restrained. As a result, Salim the Grim began to think of his father as an appeaser and a weakling. When the goblet from Shah Ismail arrived in Istanbul, that's the goblet I mentioned, um, Salim took it as a mortal insult. That heretic who calls himself by God's name should be taught his manners, he declared. He picked up the cup as a duelist picks up the glove that has struck him in the face. I will drink Safavid blood from this cup, he promised his father. Argalia stepped forward, and I will pour that wine. Well, the, old, the father refuses permission for the war, and so, of course, they depose him. Um, and he's sent into, into retirement. 
and on the way into exile, he dies of a broken heart, uh, which was just as well. The world had no room for men who had lost their nerve. Salim, with Argalia at his side, hunted down and strangled all his brothers and then killed their sons as well. Order was restored. Um, <laughs> And, and the risk of a coup eliminated. Then it was time to face Shah Ismail. Argalia and his janissaries were sent to Rum in north central Anatolia, arrested thousands of the Shiite residents and slaughtered thousands more. That kept the bastards quiet while the army marched across their land to deliver Salim the Grim's letter to the Shah. In this message, Salim said, you no longer uphold the commandments and prohibitions of the divine law. You have incited your abominable Shiite faction to unsanctified sexual union and you have shed innocent blood. 100,000 Ottoman soldiers made camp at Lake Van in eastern Anatolia on the way to push these words down Shah Ismail's blasphemous throat. Among their ranks were 12,000 Janissary musketeers under Argalia's command. There were also 500 cannons chained together to form an impassable barrier. The battlefield of Chaldiran was to the northeast of Lake Van, and there the Persian forces made their stand. Shah Ismail's army was only 40,000 men strong, almost all of them cavalrymen. But Argalia, surveying their battle array, knew that superior numbers did not always decide a fight. Like Vlad Dracula in Wallachia, Ismail had used a scorched earth strategy. Anatolia was bare and charred, and the advancing Ottomans found little to eat or drink. Salim's army was tired and hungry when it camped by the lake after its long march, and such an army is always beatable. Afterwards, when Argalia was with the princess, she told him why her former lover had been defeated. Chivalry, she said, foolish chivalry, and listening to some stupid nephew of his and not to me. The extraordinary fact is that the enchantress of Persia, along with her slave, the mirror, was present on the command hill above the field of battle. Her thin veiling garment blowing against her face and breasts in the breeze so suggestively that when she stood outside the king's tent, her beauty turned the soldier's thoughts entirely away from war. He must have been mad to bring you, Argalia said. Argalia told her when blood filthy and kill sick, he found her abandoned at the death heavy end of the day. Yes, she said, matter of factly, I drove him mad with love. However, in the matter of military strategy, not even her enchantments could make him heed her. Look, she cried, they are still building their defensive fortifications. Attack now when they aren't ready. And look, she cried, they have 500 cannons chained in a line and 12,000 riflemen behind. Don't just gallop at them head on or you'll be cut down like fools. And don't you have guns? You know about guns. For pity's sake, why didn't you bring any guns? To which the Shah's nephew, Durmish Khan the Fool, answered, it would not be sportsmanlike to attack them when they are not ready to fight. And it would not be noble to send our men to attack them from the rear. And the gun is not a weapon for a man. The gun is for cowards who do not dare to fight at close quarters. Yet however many guns they have, we will take the fight to them until it is hand to hand. Courage will win the day, not huh, these arquebuses and muskets. She turned to Shah Ismail in a kind of laughing despair. Tell this man he is an idiot, she commanded him. But Shah Ismail of Persia answered, I am not a caravan thief to go skulking in the shadows. Whatever is decreed by God will occur. She refused to watch the battle, sitting instead inside the royal tent with her face turned away from the door. The mirror sat beside her and held her hand. Shah Ismail led a charge down the right wing that smashed the Ottoman left, but the enchantress had turned away her face. Both armies suffered terrible losses. The Persian cavalry cut down the flower of the Ottoman horsemen, the Illyrians, the Macedonians, the Serbians, the Epirots, Thessalians, and Thracians. On the Safavid side, the commanders fell one by one. And as they died, the enchantress in her tent murmured their names. Muhammad Khan Ustajlu, Hussein Beg Lala Ustajlu, Saru Pira Ustajlu, and so on, as if she could see everything without looking. 
and the mirror reflected her words so that the names of the dead seemed to echo in the royal tent. Amir Nizamuddin Abdul Baki, Al Baki. But the name of the Shah, who believed himself to be God, was not spoken. The Ottoman center held, but the Turkish cavalry was on the verge of panic when Argalia ordered the artillery to be brought up. You bastards, he screamed at his own janissaries, if any of you try to run, I'll turn the fucking cannons on you. The Swiss giants, armed to the teeth, ran on foot along the Ottoman battle line to add emphasis to Argalia's threats. Then the thunder of the guns began. The storm has started, the enchantress said, sitting in her tent. The storm, the mirror replied. There was no need to look as the Persian army died. It was time to sing a sad song. Shah Ismail was alive, but the day was lost. He had fled the battlefield, wounded, without coming for her. She knew it. He has gone, she told the mirror. Yes, he has gone, the other assented. We are at the enemy's mercy, the enchantress said. Mercy, the mirror replied. The men posted outside the tent to guard them had run away as well. They were two women alone upon a field of dreadful blood. That was how Argalia found them, sitting unveiled and straight-backed and alone, facing away from the door of the royal tent at the end of the Battle of Chaldaran and singing a sad song. The Princess Karakoz turned to face him, making no attempt to shield the nakedness of her features from his gaze, and from that moment on they could only see each other and were lost to the rest of the world. He looked like a woman, she thought, like a tall, pale, black-haired woman who had glutted herself on death. How white he was, as white as a mask, upon which, like a bloodstain, those red, red lips, a sword in his right hand and a gun in his left. He was both things, swordsman and shootist, male and female, himself in his shadow as well. She abandoned Shah Ismail as he had abandoned her and chose again. This pale-faced woman-man. Afterwards, he would claim her and her mirror as spoils of war, and Selim the Grim would agree. But she had chosen him long before, and it was her will that moved everything that followed. Don't be afraid, he said in Persian. Nobody in this place knows the meaning of fear, she replied. And beneath those words, the real words, will you be mine? Yes. I am yours. So they go back to Istanbul um, with the army. And, um, okay, so obscene tulips coming. Um, when she undressed Argalia and found tulips embroidered on his underclothes, she understood that he was addicted to his superstitions, that like any man whose work is death, he did what he could to ward off the last day. When she removed his undergarments and found them tattooed on his shoulder blades and buttocks, and even on the thick shaft of his penis, she knew for certain that she had met the love of her life. <laughs> you don't need those flowers anymore, she told him, caressing them. Now you have me instead to be your good luck charm. He thought, yes, I have you, but only until I don't only until you choose to leave me as you left your sister, to change horses again as you changed from shy smile to me. A horse is only a horse, after all. She read his mind, and seeing that he needed further reassurance, she clapped her hands. The mirror came into the flower-heavy bedchamber. Tell him who I am, she said. She is the lady who loves you, the mirror said. She can charm the snakes from the ground and the birds from the trees and make them fall in love, and she has fallen in love with you so now you can have anything you desire. The enchantress made a small movement of her eyebrow and the mirror let her clothes fall to the floor and slipped into the bed. She is my mirror, the enchantress said. She is the shadow that shines. Who wins me gets her as well. At this point, Argalia, the great warrior, admitted defeat. In the face of such an outflanking assault, the only course left to a man was unconditional surrender. For many years, he'd had the honor of being permitted as a recipient of the Sultan's favor to reside in chambers in the abode of bliss, the Topkapi Palace, 
instead of the Spartan accommodation at the Janissary barracks. Now that the chambers had the added grace of a woman's touch, they began to feel like a true home. But home was always a troubled, dangerous idea for men like Argalia to allow themselves to believe in. It could catch at them like a noose. Salim the Grim did not think of Argalia as his indispensable right-hand man, but as a probable and dangerous rival for power, a popular general who could lead his janissaries into the inner sanctum of the palace just as, just as he'd done once before when he killed the Grand Vizier. A man capable of murdering the Vizier was also capable of regicide. Such a man had perhaps outlived his usefulness. As soon as they were back in Istanbul, the Sultan, while publicly lavishing praise on his Italian commanding officer for his part in the famous victory of Chaldiran, began secretly to plot Argalia's destruction. News of Argalia's precarious position came to his ears because of Karakos' decision to continue to satisfy his love of tulips. There were gardens all round the abode of bliss, walled gardens and sunken gardens, woodland areas where deer wandered freely and waterside lawns sloping down to the Golden Horn. The tulip beds were to be found in the fourth court and on the low hill at the northern end of the Topkapi complex, the highest point in the entire abode of bliss, where there were small wooden pleasure pavilions called kiosks. The tulips grew around them in great numbers and created an air of fragrant serenity and peace. The princess, Karakos, and her mirror, demurely veiled, often walked in these gardens and rested in the kiosks, drinking sweet juices, speaking gently to the many palace bostanches, the gardeners, to get them to gather flowers for Lord Argalia, and to prattle idly as women will about the innocent gossip of the day. Soon all the garden staff, from the lowliest weed puller to the head gardener himself, were deeply enamored of the two ladies, and consequently loose-tongued, as only true lovers are. Many of them remarked how swiftly the two foreign ladies had become proficient in the Turkish language. Almost overnight, or so it seemed, as if by magic, the gardeners said. But Karakos's true purposes were far from innocent. She knew, as all new residents of the abode of bliss swiftly came to know, that the 1001 Bostanchis were not only the Sultan's gardeners, but his official executioners as well. Also true, by the way. If a woman was convicted of a crime, it was a Bostanchi who sewed her, still alive, into a sack weighted down with stones and threw her into the Bosphorus. If a man was to be killed, a group of gardeners grabbed him and performed an act of ritual strangulation. So Karakos befriended the gardeners and learned what they called with dark humor the tulip news. And soon enough, the stink of betrayal began to overpower the fragrance of the flowers. The gardeners warned her that her lord, the great general, servant of three sultans, was in danger of being tried on trumped-up charges and, and sentenced to death. The head gardener himself told her so. The Bostanchi Basha of the abode of bliss was the sultan's executioner-in-chief, chosen not only for his horticultural skills, but also for his running speed, because when a grandee of the court was condemned to death, he was given a chance not granted to common men. If he could outrun the Bostanchi Basha, he could live his sentence would be commuted to banishment. But the Bostanchi Basha was famous for being able to run like the wind, so the chance was in reality no chance at all. On this occasion, however, the gardener was not happy about what he'd have to do. To execute such a great man would make me feel ashamed, he said. Then said the enchantress, we must find a way out of the situation if we can. He will kill you soon, she came home and told Argalia. The gardens are full of rumor. Argalia said gravely, on what pretext, I wonder? The princess took his pale face in her hands. I am the pretext, she said. You have taken a Mughal princess as a spoil of war. He did not know that when he gave you leave, but he knows it now. To capture a Mughal princess is an act of war against the Mughal king. And he will say, by placing the Ottoman Empire in such a position, you have committed treason and must pay the price. Such is the news the tulips have to tell. Forewarned, Argalia had time to make plans, and on the day they came for him, he had already sent Karakos and the mirror under cover of night, along with treasure chests, 
holding the wealth he had amassed on many successful military campaigns and protected by the four Swiss giants and the entire company of his most loyal janissaries, some 100 men in all, to wait for him at Bursa to the south of the capital. If I run away with you, he said, Salim will hunt us down and murder us like dogs. Instead, I must stand trial, and after I am condemned, I must win the gardener's race. It was what Karakos had known he would say. If you are determined to die, she told him, I suppose I will have to allow it. By which she meant she would have to save his life. And it would be hard because she would not be present at the scene of the great race. As soon as Salim the Grim, in the throne room of the abode of bliss, pronounced the sentence of death on the traitor Argalia, the warrior, knowing the rules, spun on his heel and began to run. From the throne room to the fish house gate, it was about half a mile through the palace gardens, and he had to get there before the Bostanchi Basha in his red skull cap, white muslin breeches and bare chest, who was already in hot pursuit and gaining on him with every stride. If he was caught, he would die at the fish house and be thrown into the Bosphorus where all the dead bodies went. As he ran between the flower beds, he saw the fish house gate ahead, heard the footsteps of the Bostanchi Basha close behind him, and knew he could not run fast enough to escape. Life is absurd, he thought, to survive so many wars and then be strangled by the gardener. <laughs> Truly, as it said, there are no heroes who do not learn the emptiness of heroism before they die. He remembered how as a young boy he had first discovered the absurdity of life, abandoned alone in a small rowboat in the middle of a naval battle in a fog. All these years later, he thought, I'm having to learn the lesson all over again. No satisfactory explanation was ever given of why Sultan Salim the Grimm's fleet-footed head gardener suddenly fell down clutching his stomach just 30 paces from the end of the gardener's race or why he then succumbed to a bout of the foulest farting anyone had ever smelled, <laughs> releasing blasts of wind as loud as gunshots and crying out in pain like an uprooted mandrake, while Argalia ran past the finishing post at the fish house gate, mounted the horse waiting for him, and galloped on into exile. Did you do something? <laughs> Argalia asked his beloved when he met her at Bursa. What could I have done to my dear little Borsa, to my dear little Basha, she answered, wide-eyed. To send him a message, thanking him in advance for slaying you, my vile abductor, along with a jug of Anatolian wine, to demonstrate my gratitude? That is one thing, yes. But to calculate exactly how long a certain potion stirred into the wine would take before it had its effect on his stomach, why, that would be quite impossible, of course. <laughs> when he looked into her eyes, he saw no sign of any subterfuge there, no indication that she or her mirror, or both of them together, might have done anything to persuade the gardener to fail in his duty, perhaps even to take the drink at a time specified in advance, in return for a moment of bliss that would last such a man a lifetime. No, Argalia told himself, as Karakos's eyes drew him deeply into their spell. Nothing of that sort could have happened. Behold the eyes of my beloved, how guileless they are, how full of love and truth. Thank you. Thank you. Well, your turn now. So there's microphones there and there and up there and there. So if you could go to them, <laughs> we could talk. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, congratulations on being knighted. Uh, oh, thank you. I'm interested in the writing style. A lot of writers are not comfortable with having somebody else do their research. And your book has a bibliography in the back of it. You've done a lot of research. How does that work? You continue to do the research, or am I? It's not a trade secret, I hope, but... No, you know. nothing's a trade secret. I know. But, I mean, some writers don't think it's their project unless they do all, you know, as you know, all the research. 
Well, I did a lot of the research myself, it's true. I mean, I certainly did all the Eastern stuff myself because it involved going to India and talking to Indian historians and, and getting books which were not easily available outside India. Um, I did actually use a research assistant, well, one and a half research assistants, half, half in Emory and one in New York. Um, and, and that was, it just speeded it up a bit. But what, what I learned very quickly is that in order to get the most out of a helper, you have to be very, very specific in what you ask them. You know, I mean, if you just ask people to tell you generally about social life in Florence in the 16th century, you get back answers which are too vague and, and, and in the end not helpful. So I would have to formulate very precise lines of inquiry for them. You know, I would have to say, go away and find me recipes. You know, I want to know what people would eat for a banquet, what they would eat every day of the week, what you would eat if you were poor, what you would eat if you were rich, you know, uh, et cetera. And, and if you could set people a question like that, then, then, then you know, they would come back with fantastic, I mean, like hundreds of, of Renaissance recipes, which actually in at least one case prevented me from making the kind of howler that somebody would have been delighted to discover. Um, for instance, because in, in this period, amazingly, Italian cooking used no tomatoes. I mean, that would have been, you know, a nice bolognese sauce would have been perfectly easy to offer somebody in the book, and it would have been anachronistic, and somebody, some smart ass, you know, would have, would have found it out. Um, so, so that's one, one example of how research can save you. Um, but also, I mean, I, it, it also allows you to do things. So, for instance, one of the questions I asked somebody was to find out about bad language. And if people got angry with each other, how did they swear at each other? And it's certainly increased enormously my creativity in that regard <laughs> <laughs> to, to get a, a long list of 16th century terms of abuse. Um, many of which are still applicable, um, and in Italian, which makes them sound good. Um, so, so I, mean, I use research in that way. You know? But in, in the end, there's always a moment when you have to put the research away. You know, because uh, if, there's a, you have to reach a moment, or I felt that I did, um, when you simply feel, okay, I know this world now, and now I can put the research away and I can just write the book as I would write a book about the contemporary world. You know, that I, that I, but you, I, my knowledge level has sort of reached that point. And there was a very specific moment, actually. And I remember going to the Mughal capital, Fatehpur Sikri, which still stands there like this beautiful ruin in the desert, um, this red sandstone city outside Agra. And I strongly recommend, if anybody is planning a visit to the Taj Mahal, that they should take the extra hour it takes to go out of Agra to see Fatehpur Sikri. Um, which in many ways is more extraordinary. Anyway, I was walking around there having done all this research and, and really, although I've been there many times in my life, looking at it as if I'd never been there before and suddenly able to see it through the new knowledge that I had acquired about it um, and excited and being able to suddenly see how my characters would get from here to there and what scene would happen where and how it would work. You know? And there, I went with a writer friend of mine and there was a point in the afternoon when I said to him, he'd never been there before, I said to him, look, if you want to stay and look around some more, we should do that because it's a beautiful place. But I just want to tell you that I'm done now. I have what I need. I'm finished. And I just had suddenly this very clear moment of, you know, things going click. I thought, okay, got it now. Go home, work. You know? And, and I, that's the moment I'd waited for, to, to, to bring my knowledge to that level. And then after that, actually, the book was not that difficult to write. I mean, well, the difficult thing was to get my knowledge there. Well, nobody said, just let me ask one more question. I, I, I'm sorry. sorry. I was just going to ask on a personal note. Yeah. Uh, when the, the fatwa oh, was yeah. issued, yeah. Actually, what was that like personally, and then when it was lifted? It was first bad and then good. <laughs> um, as opposed to, for example, the other way around. <laughs> no, I mean, what do you want me to say? It was that I would recommend, if possible, not being sentenced to death by, by, by the eyes of that lady. Um, he's fortunately dead, but, you know, if you could possibly avoid major world despots um, sending assassins to kill you, it's, it's, you know, 
it would be to your advantage. Um, and I was dumb enough to not, know, not take my own advice. Um, anyway, no, it was bad, and then it took a long time, and it's better now. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Um, one of my favorite books is Haroon and the Sea of Stories. And um, I, would, I would just like to know, like, like to hear you say, like, the inspiration and um, just talk mm. about the writing of that book. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, well Haroon is my older son's middle name. That's for a start. Um, he, at the time, was annoyed that I hadn't used his first name. Um, but I think now he's kind of relieved. <laughs> <laughs> that, he do, that he doesn't have that book hanging right at, like a millstone around his neck. I wrote it for him. Um, I mean, when I was writing the book before, which was the Satanic Verses, uh, and he was then, I don't know what, eight, nine years old, eight years old, uh, he, I remember him saying to me that he thought it was dumb that I wasn't writing any books that he could read, um, and that I should. And so I made a deal with him. I said, you know, if you just let me finish this book I'm writing, then I'll, I'll write one for you, you know, next. Right, that, the book that sends you into hiding, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so then, you know, the Satanic Verses happened, and it was, it was uh, you know, an awful time. And I'm, it was an awful time for him, too, you know. And, and, uh, and I felt, given that my day-to-day -day relationship with him was pretty disrupted for a while there, um, I thought this is a promise I'd better keep. You know, um, and, um, and it actually it did me a great service because it gave me the energy to go back to writing when, frankly, I hadn't felt very much like doing that. You know? um, and, um, and out came this book, and, and I, I was pretty happy about it. I read, I'd written about three or four chapters of it, and I quite liked it, so I thought, I thought I'd better show it to him and see what he thought, so I did. And he was very serious. And he said, yes, he, he said, it's good. I said, good. <laughs> and he said, well, some people might not like it. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, not me, of course, I'd read it, but some people might not. And I, I said, well, why? And he used this wonderful phrase. He said, it doesn't have enough jump in it. I said, jump? He said, yeah, it doesn't have enough jump. And I said, I can do jump, you know. <laughs> Get out, actually. You know. so, so I went away and, and rewrote it with extra added jump. jump. And, and then later on showed it to him again, and I said, what do you think now? And he said, yeah, now it's okay. <laughs> you know, so, so it was in many ways the best literary criticism I ever received. That, you know, uh, the, certainly the most practically useful um, editorial advice that I was ever given. Um, and anyway, so I wrote it, and, and he... I, I had felt the difficult thing about that book, you know, which sort of is and is not a children's book, um, in the way I think that many of the children's books I most admired could be described. I mean, I think Alice in Wonderland is and is not a children's book. Mm -hmm. um, but you want to write it in such a way that children can get from it children's pleasure mm -hmm. and, and that adults could get from it something else. You know, and I, I wanted it to have that... that and for me, the hard thing was to find that tone of voice. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking that, you know, the movies do this all the time. You know, if you go and see, I don't know what, Star Wars, or, you know, or half the movies that are out these days, you know, it, it becomes difficult to ask other children's films or grown-up films. You know, they, they seem to be everyone's films. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and I thought, if it happens in the movies so easily, there must be a similar kind of a tone of voice that if you could just hit it, that would work on the page as well. And for me, that was the, the difficult thing about finding that book. And I also thought of it kind of like a message in a bottle. I thought, you know, if he's going to read it now, aged 11 or so, and he's going to read it like an 11-year-old, and I hope, you know, will enjoy it. And then years will pass, and maybe he'll read it again, and he'll see another book there. And uh, I have to say, that really worked. I mean, he's 29 now. And, and he loved it as an 11-year-old, and he's loved it at every age. Mm -hmm. you know? So it struck me that, that uh, I mean, it's the only time I've ever written a book for one person. You know? uh, and, um, and it was quite an experience. So it's a good experience in a way. Then it struck me that many of the children's books that I most admired had also been written for very specific children. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that, that Alice has written for Alice Little and you know, Winnie the Pooh was written for Christopher Robin Milne and Peter Pan was written for the five Luella Davis boys and so on. You can find many examples of, of the great classics of children's literature which were literally aimed at pleasing a particular child. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and somehow, by doing that, managed to achieve a kind of universality. You know, and and I, didn't, I wasn't thinking that when I wrote it. I, this is after the fact that I thought this. Um, but I'm pleased. I mean, of all my books, I think it appears to be the one that kind of everybody likes, you know. Um, I mean, I've had my ups and downs, you know, with, um, with, with responses to my work. But that, that's a book that I think genuinely seems to have no enemies, you know. So that's, it, also got me the, it also got me the best fan mail of my life. And so now I've got to do another one because now I have another 11-year-old son. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Did you have I mean, yeah. No, I have to. I mean, I've been given the same, <laughs> the same, the same orders, you know. <laughs> The same orders, where's my book, you know? <laughs> and, and the same deal, because this was, the orders arrived while I was writing this book. And I remember saying to him, if you just let me finish this book, then I'll write that one. You know, so it's exactly the same kind of mortgaging the future, you know, in order to finish the work you've got. But now, now it's the future. Now I have to write it. So well, that's... Let's hope this one doesn't send you into hiding again also. The, the one you just wrote, the one yeah. you just finished, yes. let's hope it doesn't send you a night. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, there we are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it was enormous fun to write, I think. And, and, and oddly, given that it was written at probably the worst moment of my life, yeah. um, it's possibly the most cheerful book I ever wrote. <laughs> and it's the one which has a proper happy ending. You know, and I said, well, maybe I was really interested in happy endings right then. <laughs> um, but it's a very hard thing to achieve a happy ending in this day and age. I mean, to, to find a happy ending that doesn't feel fake, right. you know, um, a real one, mm -hmm. um, is, it's difficult. I'm quite proud of my happy ending. I've only ever managed to do it once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Um, one of your books that certainly has a lot of jump is Shalimar the Clown, I would say, oh, a wonderful you. book. But what amazed me about that book, as well as The Ground Beneath Her Feet, and I'm guessing probably Enchantress of Florence, is your uncanny ability to understand how a woman can feel. Um, oh, well, thank you. And do you, do you and, and, and the emotions, and what a woman may be thinking, and I haven't read very many male authors that are able to do that. Do you? Ask advice from women that you know no, and, and ask no. them. <laughs> <laughs> no, how, how do you do it? never ask advice, <laughs> particularly from women. No, they write the book for you. Um, no, the truth is that I mean I'm very happy that you think that, and I've I've always felt that actually in in all my books the. In many ways, to me, the female characters are in many ways more vivid than the male characters and seem, seem to be more interesting in many ways. And, um, one of the things I've learned as I've gone through this literary life is that the things that some people like about your books are exactly the things that other people won't like about your books. So, you know, there are, I'm happy to say, there's probably a majority of people who like the female characters in my books, and there are some female critics who attack me for being anti-female. Um, I mean, there was one review of this book which said that what I was doing was venting my hatred of women. You know, I, I, I thought, what hatred? You know? um, but the truth is, I, I just, I, I, I'm actually, I have always thought that what did it for me was that I, ca I came from a very female family. You know, and let's say I have, I mean, I have three sisters and no brothers. You know, and, um, and there's been a boy shortage in my family for many generations. I mean, my, my three sisters between them have not produced a male child. I mean, I've kind of broken the pattern by having two, but that's very, very rare. And if you look back several generations, it's all girls. And even not just in the linear family, but if you look in the larger extended family, if you look at the kind of aunts and cousins and so on, again, the women outnumber the men by you know, three or four to one. And so I spent my entire life growing up in this very kind of feminine, feminized environment. And these women were anything but the mild, recessive, uh, you know, cliches of, of, about India that you hear. They were, I mean, they're a very noisy family, my family. You know, there's a, they, everybody, everybody has a lot to say. 
Um, and they say it, that nobody speaks at all in the middle register. <laughs> um, so I guess I just grew up with, with a, a large number of very interesting, strong, powerful, unusual women. And, uh, and it made it sort of straightforward for me to write about people like that because those were the women I'd been most, um, spent most of my life with. Um, so, um, I mean, I also just happen to think that women are more interesting than men, but that may be just a personal thing. I don't want to offer that as a general principle. Um, it's just one man's opinion. Um, but thank you. I'm glad you think it. I mean, I know, but I never ask anybody for advice uh, until it's done. I mean, the point is that I, I can't, I feel that work in progress is a very vulnerable thing. You know, it's fragile, and you can easily lose your confidence in it. And, and if, you, if you show it, I find, for me anyway, if I show it too early, when, when I know that it's not really in a finished and okay state, and people, you know, don't laugh in the right place or lift an eyebrow in the wrong sentence, um, I think, oh, damn it, it's no good. You know, and, and, it, and it, it, it erodes my confidence in, in what I'm doing. So, I, so I've learned not to do that, to, to basically bring the book to a point where I feel that I'm not embarrassed to show it. You know, that um, embarrassment is an excellent test. I mean, if you're embarrassed, then it's not ready. You know? uh, at the point at which you think I can actually give it to somebody else to read without feeling the need to hide behind the furniture, you know, then, then it's, it's kind of ready. And at that point, I'm very interested in what everybody has to say. But at that point, you know, I do have six, seven, eight people that I've learned over the years are people who tell me the truth. Um, and I want to know everything they have to say. I want to know it in as much detail as they care to say it. But, and I listen to it very carefully and often act upon it. Um, but until that point, I tend to keep my own counsel and just try and do the best I can. Yes? Just Anybody finished. up there? Nobody up there. Very incurious people up there. <laughs> yeah, so, yes. Just finished reading about your uh, first return to India. Um, bring us up to date on your relationship with India. My your relationship with India? Yes. It's close. <laughs> I mean, I, I. No, I mean, I know what you, what you mean. I mean, there was a there was a long period of time when, again, these the difficult the, after the fatwa years when I was not really able to go there, which was a terrible rupture in that, in that relationship, and that and that lasted for nine years. You know, which is a very long time in a human life. And I must say the it, it, enormous relief when I could resume going back there uh, was probably one of the best aspects of the, uh, of the end of that dark period because, I mean, I missed it. And, and it's for me, I think anybody who's read my work can see how nourishing India has been to that work. And, and it felt very worrying to be deprived of it and, because I didn't quite know what to do, to tell you the truth. Um, I mean, I, the, one of the reasons why the book of mine that I'm most proud of in many ways is The Moor's Last Sigh is that it's, it's the only novel that I wrote actually in exile. You know, the, it's one thing to choose not to live in a place, but it's another thing to be unable to go there if you want. And, and uh, you know, normally I go to India every year and sometimes more than once a year. Um, and then there was this long period where I couldn't go at all. And to, to write a long novel set ent almost entirely in India from that condition of exile was a very big risk, I thought. And, and um, I didn't, I've never wanted to write outsider fiction about India. I've always wanted to write insider fiction about India. And, and I worried that maybe I would not be able to do that. And, and the thing that I most liked after the Boomer's Last Sigh came out, a number of friends of mine in India called me up and said, when did you sneak in here, you bastard? <laughs> <laughs> and, and refused to believe that I had written it without coming to India. He said, how do you know all that stuff? And I thought, phew. You know, if they think that, then, then that's probably okay. And, but I do, that, that was a dreadful low point in, in my relationship with India, but I'm happy to say that now it's, it's you know, it's happily restored.
Thank you for uh, speaking with us tonight, and we're glad to have you here in Atlanta. My question is a uh, bigger picture philosophical question. Uh, through your travels and your life experiences and your journeys, uh, I'm curious if you could summarize what you consider to be uh, the greatest gift and the greatest flaw of the East, as well as the greatest gift and greatest flaw of the West. Ah. And, and I hope this doesn't get you in trouble, so please render it with humor if you'd like. No, it's not going to get me in trouble. I just can't think of the answer. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't have top ten lists of flaws and qualities. Um, can I pass? <laughs> I really, I, I'm at a loss. I mean, I think... Uh, because it's the, the, you know, the categories are too large. But I, do, I don't think there is such a thing as a flaw of the East or, you know, or of the West. Um, you could point to more specific flaws, you know, if you, uh, but uh, of, for example, Americans, ignorance of geography, <laughs> um, French people, modesty, <laughs> uh, you know, and so on. But, uh, but, but the category is too big. And I, I, I remember once, one of the strangest such questions, I, was, I went to a friend of mine's wedding, a Jewish friend of mine's wedding, who was marrying another Jewish friend of mine. And I was sitting at a table with somebody I didn't know who was a very celebrated film producer, also Jewish. And he led towards me at one point during the lunch, the, you know, the celebratory lunch for our friend's wedding. And he said, so, what do you think of Jews? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, what, all of them? <laughs> and he said, yes. On, um, he said, you know, on the whole, you know, w w what's, your, what's your attitude? Um, and I said, well, I guess, on the whole, I'm for them. <laughs> and, you know, in brackets, but did not say, but in your case, I might make an exception. You know? <laughs> um, so that's what I mean by the category being too large. <laughs> yes. Um, I know you talked a little bit about your uh, research earlier and how you write a book, but I, I think uh, especially during Fury, um, I noticed that you write very in-depth characters, very developed characters. And the plots are also very developed, but they're also incredibly intertwined. You think to yourself, you know, well, of course this character would do this, and of course this happens. But which to you, when you're writing it, is, uh, is taking precedent in your mind? Hmm. Well, it's a good question, and the answer is it's not always the same thing. You know, I mean, let's say a book can come from any direction. I mean, sometimes you, I, for example, Harun in the Sea of Stories, I, I had the storyline more or less right away. I, mean, I, did, I, I didn't have to work out what the story was. What I had to work out was how to tell the story, you know, in, um, and that wasn't easy. Sometimes a character will arrive, and all you, you realize that all you need to do, and sometimes more than one character, so, and all you need to do is to follow that group of characters, and they will reveal to you the book. I mean, that's very much an experience that I had when writing Shalimar the Clown. When I felt that I had these four characters, two male, two female, who were, I found really absorbing to me. And, and I began to think of the experience of writing the book as a kind of listening. You know, that, that if I could just listen to the characters and see what they needed today, that, that they would tell me what to write. And that's kind of how that book got written. You know? and, um, I mean, similarly, you mentioned Fury. That was very much, I mean, I had the, the most, the interesting story about Fury is that I had tried to write about the central character in that novel many, many, many years before, when I was very young, much younger than that character is. I had, I had, I had been to Amsterdam, um, and I had seen these extraordinary dollhouses that they have in the Rijksmuseum, which are like social histories of Holland. You know, the, the, the big dollhouses with incredible detail of furniture and furnishings and clothes, characters and so on. And I thought, you know, it's like watching, it's like having a miniature window into the past. They're very interesting. And so I had this idea to write a story about a doll maker. 
Um, and I mean, I guess the, the, the thing about the story would be that he's somebody who was good with dolls and bad with people. You know, um, and I couldn't make the story work at all. It just, just wasn't interesting to me. I tried it in a number of different ways, and in, in the end just put it aside. And then all these years later, I'm writing this novel about New York City, and I come up with this, this figure of this grumpy middle-aged man sort of muttering his way around Manhattan, you know, blaming everybody for everything. Um, and he may or may not be a serial killer. Um, and, um, and I suddenly thought, I know who you are. You're the damn doll maker. You know, and, and it was this, this abandoned character from 25 years earlier. You know, and I suddenly thought, oh, I know, how, I know who you are now. And, and that opened up that book in many ways. So, as I say, you just never know where it's coming from. Sometimes it's the narrative line, sometimes it's the character. Sometimes, I mean, Midnight's Children, in many ways, the key to Midnight's Children was, the, was, the, was discovering this image of, the, of a bed sheet with a hole in it um, that the grandparents met through and fell in love because he fell in love with her as her doctor by seeing her in six-inch six fragments uh, and then had to add her up in his head, having never seen her undressed in total. Um, and I, I thought that, in a way, gave me a strategy for the novel. You know, it, was, it became a novel about a world seen in fragments, and which you had to add up you know, in order to see the full body of it, which were never shown entirely at any given time. So you never know where it's coming from. You just, you just have to know when you've got it. You know, which, that's the, I mean, the two things that are most difficult, I think, in writing is one to know when it's good and the other is to know when it's bad. I mean, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're both they're equally difficult um, to either o not to overpraise your own work to yourself and not to underpraise it. You know, um, I, I mean, Heng Hemingway said that every writer, what the, every writer most needs is a shit detector. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's true. You really have to know that. You have to know, you have to know when it's shit. You know? um, um, but you also have to know when it's good. And that's sometimes trickier. You know, uh, sometimes it's clear. There's just, you know, there's a scene in Sha the movie Shakespeare in Love uh, where he writes, I don't know what he writes, to be or not to be or something <laughs> trivial. And, and he, stands up, he, he's, he stands up and he snaps his fingers and he says, God, I'm good. <laughs> and you've got the, I have always hoped that Shakespeare knew that. You know, and actually, there's, in my view, there's no question that he did. I think it's not possible to write that work and not know what it is. You know, um, but I think all of us at these lower levels still have to be aware of when it's okay and when you should not touch it. You know, there's sometimes you write passages and you think just whatever you do, do not touch this, leave it alone. You know? I mean, sadly, those days don't happen that often. But, um, so as I say, it, it's, uh, it, the only rule is there isn't a rule. I mean, every book I've written has, I mean, there's no two books I've written that showed up in the same way. You know? and, I mean, it's, it's as if each book comes with a different set of possibilities and a different set of problems. And, and all you learn by finishing a book is how to write that book. But that's no longer useful because you've written it. <laughs> and then you have to find how to write the next one. Yeah. Nobody up there. Yes, somebody up there, look. <laughs> there we are. We salute you, sir. <laughs> no, after you. Um, first of all, you mentioned uh, towards the beginning that this was the last of three or four different ideas that you had for the Enchantress of Florence. Um, I was just wondering if you could possibly elaborate on maybe what uh, what those earlier ideas were, why you came up with them, why you rejected them. Oh. Um, and second of all, just very briefly, um, just out of pure curiosity, I'd like to know, uh, who's your favorite poet? And if who's you don't my mind, favorite what? Poet. And if poet. you don't mind, why? Well, that's <laughs> a, actually the favorite poet is a very hard question because I read a lot of poetry. And, and actually, when I'm writing fiction, I usually try and read a little poetry every day because it's just a way of reminding a prose writer to pay that kind of attention to the language, mm -hmm. you know, um, and 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 I, I kind of don't care what the poetry is. It's not that you know it can be anything. I just go to the shelf and pick something off and open it and read it. It can be C. P. Cavafy or Wallace Stevens, I and mean, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it can be it can be John Berryman or Ted Hughes. I mean, it does. It, you know, or, or 
I don't know, Vislava Shimborska or Czeslav Milos, etc. The world is full of great poets. And, and, um, and I don't even read that much. I might read just one poem or two you know, on, on, in a day, but it's just I use it as a way of keeping myself up to the mark you know, and, and, and saying don't, don't slack off just because you're writing something long. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's very easy when writing something that's a novel length to sometimes surrender to uh, a, a lazy sentence, just as a way of getting where you need to go. Um, and sometimes, actually, lazy sentences, I mean, simple sentences are necessary. You don't, not every sentence has to be high poetry. Sometimes you actually need the sentences which say, he came in and shut the door. You know, um, uh, and, um, you know then she died. You know, sometimes you need those very bold sentences. It doesn't all have to be flowery and ornate. You know? right. But uh, it's just a way, I mean, a lot of poetry is not flowery and ornate. I think actually a lot of the poetry that I like most is not. It's quite lean, muscular. You know? um, so I don't have a favorite poet, but I have a million favorite poets. And I, I mean, I just have a daily relationship with poetry, which I think has helped me um, a lot. Um, what was the first part? Oh, rejected plots. Well, I mean, for instance, the, 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 one of the first ideas I had about how to bring these two worlds together, I mean, I always knew that there'd be this troublesome woman, but I wasn't sure who she was. Um, and initially, I thought there might be, it, it might be that the Mughal emperors send an embassy to Europe, because again, I was trying to invent the things that didn't happen, you know, and I knew that that, that had never happened. But supposing they were to send an ambassador and a kind of entourage, and, and in that ambassadorial party there was this woman who would become the source of all the novel's discontents. And, and that was an early idea, but then again I thought, I actually thought I can't make that work because, because of what I described as the shape of the world. For, that, for such a party to travel safely across the world as it then was, was more or less impossible. I mean, if you did it by land, you'd get killed somewhere along the line. If you went by sea, I mean, the sea in those days was full of pirates. You know, you had Barbary Corsairs who, you know, who were really ruling the waves. Um, so I just thought, I can't make this work. There's no way that this plot can be made convincing, given the world as it really was at that time. And so that's one example of something that I dumped. And, and there were others. And then eventually, as I say, I found found out what worked. Yes. I haven't read uh, all of your books, but I've read most of them, and I apologize if this already exists, but I was wondering if your experience that led to you writing The Jaguar Smile has made you think about setting a work of fiction in Latin America. I think Latin America has its own writers. That's, that's my suspicion. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I would find it very difficult to take them on on their own turf. <laughs> um, I mean, I have such an admiration for uh, the last 40 or 50 years of South American literature. I mean, both in Portuguese and Spanish, actually, in mean, both Brazilian and, and, and Spanish, um, that I don't think I would have the guts to take them on. I mean, what? me write a novel in the middle of Garcia Marquez and Carlos Fuentes and Mario Vargas Llosa and, you know, 20 others, Borges and Jorge Amado and, you know, Machado de Assis, and then, no thank you, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I, uh, I mean the, the Nicaragua thing happened uh, kind of by accident. I mean, let's say I, I, after the, at the time of the Contra War, I had become involved with organizations, political organizations in, in England that were opposed to the Contra War. And, and um, um, that's good, 20-year-old applause, that's very good. <laughs> um, thank you for my opinions of 1986. <laughs> um, um, and then, actually, I was in New York City for the famous Penn Congress of the mid-'80s, which Norman Mailer organized. And, and um, at this very grand party at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, at the Temple of Dendur, um, I met a bunch of Sandinistas who had been invited by Norman to the party. Um, uh, there was uh, 
the writer Omar Cabezas, former Sandinista guerrilla who had written a very interesting autobiography called Fire on the Mountain, which was about having been a, a guerrilla from the mountains. And the somewhat problematic figure of Rosario Murillo, who was then as now the compañera of Daniel Ortega. Um, and some incredibly beautiful bodyguards, male bodyguards. And, and they invited me to come to see for myself what was going on. And I remember thinking, okay, so now they're trying to co-opt me. You know, I know what's happening here. And so, so I said to them, look, okay, I'll come, but I don't think I'm going to write anything. I said, if you want me to come, just come and have a look, I'd be interested to do that. But I'm not going to guarantee to write anything at all. And to their credit, they said, okay, you know, why don't you come? And so I then did go. And when I came back, I, was, I had been so affected by what I saw in Nicaragua, uh, this, this tiny little country fighting by proxy, fighting the United States, um, a country that loved so many American things, a country obsessed with baseball, um, incredibly proud of all the Nicaraguans who had made the major leagues, a country in which you would to ask people who their favorite poets were, and they would say Ezra Pound, Walt Whitman, and Marianne Moore. Um, this was the country that was being crushed, you know, um, a country that would have been so easy to make a friend of, you know, uh, was essentially being killed by the Cold War logic of, you know, America's backyard um, versus the Soviet sphere of influence, you know, these phrases that we don't even hardly remember anymore. And I came back and I just became, I had become a Nicaragua bore. I would just talk to everybody about it all the time. And in the end, I thought the only way I can shut up, essentially, is to write it down. And, and that's how that book got written. And I remember thinking, even then, I can't write, if you like, a definitive book about this. I haven't been there long enough. And I, was there, I was there for whatever it was, not even six weeks. Um, I thought all I could do is write a series of snapshots. I can write, you know, about this moment, that moment, this thing, that thing, and try and make it come to life that way, you know. And, I mean, fortunately, I was given remarkable access. I mean, for instance, a lot of Western journalists in those days, the Sandinistas didn't like them to go to the Atlantic coast because the Atlantic coast um, around Bluefields and around there was the area where the Sandinistas were most unpopular um, and where their treatment of... Um, Native American communities, the Miskito Indians and others, you know, was, was very problematic. Um, and it was very hard to get to the Atlantic coast because there really weren't any roads and the Contras were, were controlling the river, the waterways and there were road landmines and there was all, and there was one small, there was one light aircraft that would fly from Managua to Bluefields every day. And it was literally, you know, it'd take 12 seater plane. And, and these seats were booked by government officials, you know, block booked for the whole year. And you couldn't get on. But I managed to get on because they, managed, they, they decided that I would be, somehow they decided I'd be okay to let me go. Uh, so I did manage to get into some interesting areas and so I thought the book was worth doing. I mean, it was, um, but that's all it was. It was, it was, a, it was a, a moment of where I found myself as a reporter so affected by what I was seeing that I had to report on it, you know, and, and uh, that's it. But fiction, I, not, not Latin American fiction, no thank you. Two more questions. All right, there's one up there and one down here. Yes, sir. Yep. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of take you back to India a little bit. Mm. And um, I, I'm a big fan of Indian literature. Um, and I wonder what the influence of Western ideas is on oh. Indian literature and Indian culture and civilization. Oh, well, they, you Your know. novel is about the, the transfer of ideas. Yeah, well, the influence of Western ideas is everywhere, you know. I mean, it's everywhere in the world, whether it's China or Japan or India, um, because it's a small world. Um, and actually, and specifically, if one thinks about the novel, there really only have been novel-length fictional prose texts in India for slightly more than 100 years, maybe 120 years. Um, the novel is not an indigenous form. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a form brought in from outside. Uh, and even though now there are languages, Indian languages, in which there is 
you know, a more than century old history of the novel. Um, that's all it is. It's not 200 years old. It's not 300 years old. You know, so if, you, if you actually are interested in the novel as a form, you are going to have to look outside India. You know, and, uh, you're going to, there is no 18th century fiction in India. You know, there's no I Indian equivalent of Lawrence Stern you know, um, or, or Samuel Richardson. Um, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no Tom Jones. There's no, you know, there's, if, you, if you look at the classics, this is a world in which that period contained no fiction. So in that sense, anyone writing prose fiction in India, I would suspect, especially in English, but not only in English, uh, I mean, I know, for instance, some of the, I mean, Sadat Hassan Manto is a great uh, Urdu language short story writer, um, was very influenced by all kinds of things, Russian literature, for example. Um, and so that's, that's inevitable. I mean, of course you are. But, but it's even deeper than that because the historical engagement between India and Britain was so profound, went on so long. Um, that, that the cultures affected each other very profoundly. You know, and and um, you can still see in India, even now, a kind of legacy of the, of the British. I mean, after all, the British wrote the Constitution. You know, the British wrote the legal system. Um, and so on. I mean, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it, it, colonialism has after effects which last much, much longer than the colonial period. Um, and, and now, of course, there is this extraordinary flourishing literature in English, um, which I think it's down to two or three things. I mean, one is, of course, just the global power of the English language. But, you know, if, if you write in English, you give yourself a world audience, you know, which, which you don't if you write in Hindi or Bengali or Tamil, or whatever it might be. But there's also an internal Indian reason, which is that so to speak, you, what you might call the novel reading class, let's say the kind of university educated class, w can read in English wherever in India they live, uh, whether they're in Tamil Nadu or Bengal or Gujarat or Kashmir or Bombay. Um, and so an Indian writer writing in English can be read in his own country across all internal language barriers. Um, whereas if you write in, there is a major problem in India, which is that the quality of intra-Indian translations is not good at all. And, and, you know, uh, so, so if you write in Kannada, which is one of the great literary languages of India, it's very improbable that anyone not reading Kannada will really have much sense of what your writing is like. Even in the case of Rabindranath Tagore, the only Indian writer to win the Nobel Prize, V.S. Naipaul being West Indian. Um, this is V.S. Naipaul once fired a publisher for describing him as the great West Indian novelist. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's a person born and raised in Trinidad um, of Indian descent. Rabindranath Tagore was the, was the real thing. But again, the Bengali, Bengali is a notoriously difficult language to translate from. Um, and many of the versions of Tagore that exist in other Indian languages are don't give you really the sense of Tagore. Um, and the English language writers don't have this problem. And, and I think it's not accidental that those two factors, the power of English in the marketplace worldwide and the transboundary effect of English inside India, you know, has meant that so many of the most interesting younger writers coming up in India now are writing in English. You know, and it's a, it really is a new thing, because I, I remember when Midnight Children came out in 1981, um, being asked in India by journalists who were the other Indian writers who were my contemporaries that I liked to read. And I truthfully, I couldn't think of anyone. And it wasn't that I was being you know, arrogant. It was that I actually couldn't think of anyone. I could think of writers older than myself. You know, I could think of R.K. Narayan and Mukharaj Anand and Anita Desai and you know, plenty of writers of generations earlier than myself. But amongst my contemporaries, I really couldn't name anyone. And I thought, I said, I remember saying to journalists then, well, maybe 
this is kind of the end of a line. Maybe, it's, maybe there's not going to be an Indian literature in English. Why should there be? It's not, you know, the, this is no longer the British Empire. And maybe the, 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 the languages of India will just take over the literary burden and we won't, maybe Midnight's Children represents the end of a line rather than anything else. And I thought that was, it was possible to believe that, you know, in 1981. And five minutes later, it became clear that I didn't know what the hell I was talking about, you know, because, because this, this kind of flood of stuff came out. And uh, it's wonderful to have, you know, to have seen it happen um, and to have been kind of in on the beginning of it. It's very, very odd, I have to say, to have spent a lot of one's life being the kind of hot kid on the block and suddenly to turn into the old fart. <laughs> it is, it is, it's very difficult, but I'm, I'm trying to live with it. All right, well, there's people standing here. All right, very quickly, very quickly. One, two, three. Quick questions, quick answers. Um, through your own journeys, literary, physical, your choice or not, you've traveled the world, you've covered the world, and part of why you are so enormous as a writer is that you're able to capture the zeitgeist of where you are, reflect upon it, and then say something new and, and witty about it back to the people who've lived it for so long. Now, to yourself, in your own mind, have you ever felt a sense of dis displaced sense of self, the displacement classic, um, where you've lived, where you've grown up, now writing, hmm. now that the world claims you, India wants you, Britain wants you, Atlanta wants you, so how do you now? Yes, you? my fellow Atlantans, I know. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think everyone who's led this kind of life sees it both as a blessing and a curse. You know, I mean, there's, it clearly has given me, uh, you know, I hope the ability to see the world from more than one perspective. And, and, um, and that's, I think, uh, been a help to me as, as a writer. But I also, I really envy the writers who never left home. You know, and, I mean, and actually one of the reasons I've been always very attracted to the literature of the American South is because there are so many writers of that kind. You know, the, 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 the Eudora Welty, Flannery O'Connor, William Faulkner kind of writer, you know, who can simply live in and know one tiny patch of the earth you know, so well that they can make it the universe, you know. And, and uh, I've always thought that would have been great, you know. Um, and I guess the, you, you think about the, the, the road not traveled. You know, if I'd, if I'd spent the rest of my life in Bombay, a city which has gone through extraordinary transformations, you know, in, in the last 20, 25 years. I mean, I could have written about it in a way that I now feel uneasy to write about it. And so, yeah, you always lose something. You always lose something. Um, and you just have to hope that what you gain makes up for it. But, yeah, you always feel that. You feel the displacement anxiety. And, and, and you know, some days it feels exciting because you feel like you have, if you like, multiple routing. You know, you're rooted in too many places. And other days you feel that you, don't, that you just don't have any connection to anywhere at all. And yeah, of course you feel, you feel all that. So it's both things at once, and you just have to try and ride the horse, you know. Yes, sir. Earlier you said that the job of the novelist is to write what is not, to invent what is not. You also talk about having the two ends of the bridge, or two ends and building the bridge in between. When Sherman came to burn Atlanta, my family didn't evacuate. They saved their homes and several churches from being burnt. I'm writing a story about the past and projecting a solution to that wound into the future. Have you thought about doing something like that for the differences that rampage through India? And the... No. No? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I don't see, I really don't see writing as being medicinal or restorative or curative of anything, really. Um, um, it's too much to ask it to be. I mean, I think it's, it's hard enough to make it truthful um, and interesting and unafraid. 